Wow, yes. We are down to our final speaker, and he's one that barely needs an introduction. If you've ever been on YouTube, you know exactly who Aaron Ra is. He's the president of Atheist Alliance of America. He hosts the Ramen Godcast <laughs> podcast, and he's the director. I know. I'm like I'm I'm zoning here. Explorer Project. He's also the producer of Living Science Lessons, a classroom supplement series teaching biology to middle school students. Let's give a huge welcome for the first appearance in Sacramento, Aaron Ray. All right, thank you very much. It's, re it's hard for me to believe that I was booked to come after Shelley Siegel and booked to come after David Silverman. I'm going to have to eat an underdog super energy pill to see if I can get the energy that this man has. I am, I'm here, you know, there's a lot of good books, and if you, if you read it all, if you've got time to do that, there's a lot to look at, but I'm here to peddle mine. And I want to give a little bit of a background on it. See, there's an opening, there's a conversation of sorts in the first couple of pages, and a lot of people may have some questions about what, is my, what am I referring to in these couple pages. Well, the idea for this, and uh, the, the thing that changed my life, really, was a conversation that I had with somebody that was upset that I was wearing a Darwin Fish t-shirt. And she says, you can't prove evolutionism. <laughs> and I said, well, the very fact that you call it that <laughs> betrays the problem. But then I can, actually teach evolution. She goes, well, prove it then. I said, well, I, I can't prove it standing here in the parking lot of a Dairy Queen, but if you give me, give me time, I will create a presentation that will present the facts in a way that you can understand. And she said, you can't prove evolution because you'd have to prove that there is no God. And I said, well, whether God exists or not is irrelevant. And she staggered backward at that thought, because that is actually the first foundational falsehood of creationism, the idea that you either have to accept God as a meaning the Bible, I mean, that they can't distinguish doctrine from deity, that they may as well worship a book. Because if you disprove the Bible, you disprove God, right? They are one and the same. Right? You have to either hold this all or nothing belief, or you have to, if you're going to accept science at all, then you have to reject God, which is a false dichotomy. Now, we know that many of the, the leading voices, the pioneers of evolutionary biology, have been religious believers. And some of the, some of the voices like uh, the star witness in Kitzmiller versus Dover, you know, Kenneth Miller, he was a traditional Catholic. So you can have the science, you can have the superstition, and you can do both. You don't have to have this false dichotomy. That's what makes it a falsehood. And I want to tag on to what Silverman said a little while ago. I mean, a lot of these scientists say that, uh, you know, you can't... It's something that, that science can't test for God, can't verify God, can't indicate God, can't, can't falsify God, can't prove there is no God. So science can't say anything about God. Right? And when I recorded the audiobook with David Smalley in Dogma Debate Studios, he contested me on this. And he said that there, there are some scientists, like Victor Stenger, for example, who say that one thing that science can say about God is that there's no support for that hypothesis. Because even if you meet a scientist who is himself a believer, they have to concede at least that much. But Stenger didn't stop there. He says that um, there's no value to that hypothesis either, right? Because there's, there's no epistemological value. There's no scientific value. And, God, and Stenger went on and said that God is a meaningless concept because it is undefined and undeterminable and unfalsifiable and literally immaterial with no reason to believe it. And I would add that there are several good reasons not to. Right, so he said that you know there are the scientists that say that you can't see, you, you can't prove that there is no God, and so people would tell me that you know you can't say that there's no God because we don't really know, right? Don't we? When I was debating uh, Pastor Bob Enyard of Denver Bible Church, he said that uh, he started as this game where you know there's no ev absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence, and you can't prove there is no God because you haven't looked everywhere, you don't know everything, you don't have all, all knowledge and all that. And I just I could see where he was going with that. So I said, well, just answer me this. Are there leprechauns? And I expected you know, that he was going to realize where I was going and play the stupid game, but he didn't. He just said, no, no, there's no leprechauns. <laughs> How do you know? Have you looked everywhere? I mean, have you been to the end of the rainbow? Uh, so he said, he's, he said he knows that there are no leprechauns because there's no evidence of them. 
Now, if he's going to say that there is no evidence of leprechauns, and that's sufficient for him to state as fact that there is no God, or excuse me, that there are no leprechauns because there's no evidence of them, I can state as fact that there is no God for the same reason. Hello? Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I can actually go further than that. I mean, Enyard and I, Bob Enyard and I, could both cite Hitchens' razor that positive claims require positive evidence, and uh, that which is asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. Right? That, um, that in science, there is only what is supported by evidence and what is not supported. And whatever is not supported does not warrant serious consideration. Come back when you've got something to show, when you can indicate that there's a there there. Or otherwise, we literally have nothing to talk about. So, I also want to take this opportunity to address, oh, well, you know what? I got ahead of myself. I didn't explain the reason that I got behind this book. Uh, I got to explain. This girl asked me to do, or she didn't ask me to, she, she kind of asked for it without asking for it. You follow me? Yeah, so you know, she gave me this challenge. And I'd spent years on the internet arguing with people. I mean, I spent a really unhealthy amount of my time, you know, on talk.origins and places like that, arguing with believers. And I realized that you keep coming across the same arguments again and again and again, right? There's no transitional species. There's no beneficial mutations. Evolution is a fraud, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My favorite one being that evolution is just a theory, not a fact, which is so annoying because that, that required that I had to teach middle school biology to the chairman of the board of my state board of education. She got angry that there was 150 scientists giving testimony that the theory of evolution is actually better supported than the theory of gravity. And she got upset and she wrote down that these people were trying to demote the law of gravity to being just a theory <laughs> so that evolution could look good by comparison. And so I have to show her the multiple laws of Newtonian gravity, and then compare that to Einstein's theory of relativity, which replaces it. There's also laws in Einstein's theory of relativity. So theory is an encompassing thing that includes the laws, and includes the facts, and includes the hypothesis. Right? It's an overarching explanation. It's a field of study. You can't prove a field of study. Right? Because like, like I argued in, in high school, that we had a class that taught music theory. And I remember walking in and said, you can't teach music in school. It's just a theory. It's never been proven. <laughs> Nobody got the joke then. <laughs> One of the other uh, items that we have on here is a personal to me is the tenth foundational falsehood of creationism, which is the claim that the tree of life is nowhere indicated in biology, that it's somehow contrived, that it's an illusion, right? Uh, this is when it, that this one inspired us when we got onto Patreon, patreon.com forward slash a r o n r a. We accept donations. Yeah, uh, this is how we fund ourselves. Well, anyway, what we've done, we started the. Um, the Phylogeny Explorer Project, and a lot of people have some trouble with it. I was introduced one time recently in Denver. They said that it was the Phalange Explorer Project. That's an entirely different thing. Yeah. I might be into that too, but that's later. <laughs> what it is is we're trying to create a navigable online encyclopedia for the entire tree of life. Showing, you know, and, and there's going to be illustrated with lots of explanations and it, it, literally an encyclopedia that you can navigate through to understand not the value of the species. We're not talking about what the individual species are, but what the parent uh, classifications are. Like what does it mean to be a mammal? What does it mean to be a vertebrate? What does it mean to be an ape or a monkey, for example? And my favorite one, to give an example, is like one of the very early stages of development because you can be classed by your, your characteristics as an adult but also by your development. And one of them is this. Uh, it, for all animals, you develop first as a little ball of cells. The very first trait you develop is a hole that erupts in that ball one from one end to the other. Now, in most animals, that starts out with a mouth and ends, an an ends in an anus. Except for the higher mammals, all of whom develop backward from that. The hole erupts to a mouth from an anus. Exactly back. So that literally, there is a stage in our life when you are no more than an asshole. <laughs> exactly correct. Now, I, I go through the list, and I, I don't really have time, I don't think, to go through the list right now. I can't really keep, time, uh, keep track of the time that I have, so I'm going to just jump ahead. Uh, so I come up with this series of videos, and I sent the first four of them to this person. I say, here's my presentation so far. I've got another few to do, but I want you to see what they've already done. And her response was that I was hurting people. People who want to continue believing. 
why would you want to continue to believe something you now know is not true? Right? Why would you not want to know if something you believe is not true? I mean, for most of us, I think, in this room, our sincerity is where we got to our disbelief because we care about what's really true rather than whatever we would rather believe. And I've encountered a lot of believers who say, these may be what the facts are, but I prefer to believe this. I heard one minister give a speech to his own, his own congregation saying, I have evidence that A exists, but I prefer to believe B. Although everything points to A, I'm going with B. And he admitted later in that very sermon that he knew that that meant that he was delusional and that he didn't care. He, they, they, the truth is what the facts are, and if you don't care what the facts are, you don't care what the truth is. And I've had many people walk away. That make the, they come to that point, because this, uh, this happens very often. And after you read this book, you'll notice this happening for you too. You have believers who believe what they do for sincere reasons. Because everybody believes around them. They don't know any better. They, they don't understand if it doesn't make sense to them. They think that all these smart people also believe this thing. They, you know, everybody in their family, all their leaders that they look up to, they're obviously every politician in Texas if that's where you live. Um, they all believe this thing, so there must be some kind of credence to it. But when, you, when they meet somebody who actually knows the subjects, who knows the reputations of these arguments and can show what's wrong with each of these arguments, well, then they very quickly have to make a choice, whether they want to remain honest or whether they want to remain creationist, because it is no longer possible to be both. And uh, I've seen people come to that crossroads and make that alternate choice. Now, uh, as I said, I was, I, when I recorded the, uh, I know, I want to I take the opportunity to uh, address criticisms. One of them being uh, some people in the atheist community that said that I had overstated my case when I said that the Bible was absolutely wrong about absolutely everything. <laughs> I've said the same thing about creationists, too. Now, I'll accept that there are some you know, people in places that are mentioned in the Bible that actually existed. Right? Just like, you know, creationists can be right about something occasionally. They can discover that they're out of milk or butter, and unless they're vegan, they should go buy some more. They're welcome to be right about that. But we're only talking about the relevant things, right? The claims made about evolution, the claims made about creationism, so forth, the relevant parts of this argument. Now, um, one of the things we know that is, is not true, uh, let's see, heaven, hell, um, nobody lived three days inside a fish. Right? There was no army of the undead resurrected or reanimated by God, Jehovah, praying to the four winds, which, by the way, is a pagan god. There's a beautiful part of the, story, the Bible that nobody reads. <laughs> Woman didn't come from a man's rib. A man didn't come from a golem spell. And what a golem spell is, is uh, that is where you, in the old Jewish magic, you make a clay figurine, you breathe into it the breath of life, and it comes to life. Right? This is the old Jewish magic. We know these things for absolutely certain. There's no doubt that this, these are parables. The tree of the fruit, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's no way that was a literal tree. You couldn't chop that down and build a canoe out of it. This is a parable. Everywhere in the Bible where it talks about the fruit of, it's the result of choices that you make. And it's, a, it's an obvious parable everywhere else. Clearly, it's supposed to have meant, been meant to as a parable also in the Bible. There's a lot of old myths we can compare it to that are making that kind of association. When it was originally told, when stories like this were originally told, people were not supposed to believe that they were historically true. You know, they, they were supposed to be just ideas that make you ponder things. You weren't supposed to take it literally. Now think about if you tried to take it literally. The fruit of the tree of life, right? Can you imagine gathering that up to make pies? I would try that. But now think about, you know, if, if the fruit of the tree of life actually were a literal thing and it falls off the trees, imagine all the squirrels and birds and, and insects eating the fruit of the tree of, of uh, knowledge of good and evil and discovering that they're naked. <laughs> so let's look at the, the way that the earth is described in the Bible. Absolutely wrong, right, on, ev on really everything. The way that the earth describes or the way that the Bible describes the earth, for example, is, is, is a flat disk, not a circle, not a sphere. Not, not a sphere, but a, a circle, literally a flat circle. And it's a map of the earth divided into four quadrants, sometimes miscal or mistranslated as corners. Right? So you, basically you've got a tabletop because it sits down on columns. So the earth is standing on columns, which of course we know don't exist, and it's set at the bottom of an oceanic abyss, hung upon nothing but standing on columns somehow. How do you justify that? It doesn't tell you what kind of ground it's set on. You've just got water all over it. And then you've got the firmament. Anybody ever read the Bible and say, what the hell is a firmament? 
I asked my mother about this. She was always confused about that answer, but eventually I found it. It's in several different places in the Bible. It describes a giant crystal dome over this flat, disc-shaped earth. And it's got windows in it, because remember, it's a snow globe in an ocean. Now, this was a common belief throughout Asia, right? There was a, there's, there's Orient, there's Persians that all have a similar sort of belief. It's not true, right? It was written from people that clearly didn't have any idea of the Earth and its true relation to the cosmos. The sun and the moon are both inside the expanse of this uh, firmament. They're both the same size. They're both lights. They're both bigger than the stars. The stars, by the way, have human characteristics, personalities. And in the book of Daniel, three stars come down to the earth to do battle with a mortal human being. Right? No, ch and no the sun stopping in the sky? None of this is remotely possible, right? Samson's magic hair? <laughs> well, I can see that one. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this is not a hypothesis you're going to hear from anyone else. This is probably, I think, is my own pet one. But there is a kernel of truth in the story of the Tower of Babel, one of the most ridiculous stories in the Bible. And let me tell you what it is. The tower is real. The foundation of it uh, really exists right in Babylon, right where you expect it to be. It was begun by Hammurabi around 1750 BCE. When the Mesopotamian Empire collapsed, the project stopped. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar picked it up again, 650 BC or the thereabouts. Couldn't finish it either, right? But there it is. Now, when Hammurabi started this, back way back when when he did, the Mesopotamian Empire was the uh, most advanced society on Earth. They had just invented syllabic text, so they had the only real writing on Earth, and they had formal schools teaching classrooms full of children, just like today, to read and write in cuneiform, which is pressing letters of a sort into clay tablets, which would then be baked into permanent documents. Now, when the Mesopotamian Empire collapsed, the schools closed. And if you remember what the story told, you know, the, the people lost the ability to understand what they're saying. Right? Well, now they've got tens of thousands of documents that we eventually found in Asher Bernalpol's library, dating back to 2250 BCE and are older. We don't know how much older than that. But down to at least 3,000, we know people were telling these stories, some of these stories we've been able to date, precisely. So they lost the ability to understand the stories. And those old stories that they now had in, or had cast in stone that they no longer understand how to read and write cuneiform, are now kept alive in oral tradition, being repeated again and again and again by different tribes. So we get, you again have a form of evolution where things are enhanced or exaggerated or you know you start blending together certain stories so that what was originally dedicated to the god Marduk is suddenly reappropriated to a Canaanite god who's been promoted from another pantheon. All right? And we also know, this is important too, we also know that, uh, that the Native Americans were already there thousands of years before this tower was begun. Same in Taiwan, same in Australia, all over the world. People were already speaking different languages. So that, that's the only element of truth there is to that story. Now, we saw how legends are adapted. I can give many examples. As a matter of fact, in you know, my book, I do. There are many flood legends all over the world, and they're importantly different. There's one where there's a man and a woman who survive by staying in a, sea, at a say, seashell, and there's no animals with them. And there's another one where all the people and all the animals turn into fish for the duration of the flood and then turn back into their old selves. In Greece, they survive the flood by going to the mountaintops. Now, the creationist organizations don't tell you these important differences because they want you to think it's all based on the same idea. But there's a handful of stories that seem to be virtually identical, and they come from the same region. What we now know is the Iraqi floodplain for a reason. And we know that the, the Sea of Galilee was flooded around 15,000 BC, and the Black Sea was flooded around five, or 7,000 BC, and they've now identified, geologists and archaeologists have both confirmed that there was an inundation of the city of Shurapak in Iraq around 2900 BCE. And importantly, the date that they've ascertained for this, roughly equivalent to 15 cubits. That's 22 feet, perhaps 7 meters, I don't know, I can't find a cubits to meters conversion ratio online. <laughs> but the, the important thing is that, that depth is the depth of the flood. Of, and there's many other details 
that go similar with this too, to the stories that were attributed to Ubartutu, Utapishnim, Atrahasis, Zia Sudra, um, and eventually Noah, after enough exaggerations. Now we know that that, that, that depth, it would have wiped out everything in the area, right, except for the king and his little personal menagerie, which wasn't every animal in the world, it was just what he had on his farm, right, and most of that was livestock. That's the only way it can make sense to have seven of the livestock animals and then, you know, two of the breeding pairs of whatever exotic thing you happen to have on hand. There's no other way that that story can make sense. We know that that flood would have inundated the whole area, but it wouldn't have had any effect at all on Mount Ararat, which is three miles high, and it wouldn't have had any effect on Egypt, which is thousands of miles away. Now, one of my favorite uh, YouTubers, Potholer54, a uh, hi. <laughs> uh, if, um, if you're not familiar with him, look him up. He does great creationism videos. He did one recently where he was talking about an article that was released by Answers in Genesis, talking about how you can get from what they imagined to be a flood of 2188 BCE, eight people surviving this flood, to get to seven billion people today. How do they calculate that? By doubling the population every 150 years, taking into account floods, famines, other sorts of you know, disasters, and ignoring everything we know about population growth over time, over history, because that's historic data and who cares about that. But that means that if Answers in Genesis is correct, and when has that ever happened, <laughs> that if the entire global population were to collaborate on building Egypt's very first pyramid, the Step Pyramid of Zoser, that they wouldn't have been able to do it because there would have only been 40 people in the world alive at that time. <laughs> now, Answers in Genesis understands that there would have to be a society of at least 30,000 people for a project of that magnitude, for the infrastructure to back that up. So they, how do they calculate that? Well, they have another article that is not linked to the first article, because they don't want you to read both articles, where they say the population actually grew 10 times faster than they previously said, without, of course, saying that they previously said anything. Now, in the new analysis, they say that one man and his one wife went to Egypt with eight children. Now, one man and one woman in a marriage in the Bible is rare, but this is immediately after a global extinction event. And Answers in Genesis assumes that they had eight children. In fact, the Bible only says that this guy had four sons. But daughters were never important enough to be named or even mentioned most of the time. So they assume, because that's what apologists do, that they also had four daughters and that each son married his sister. And that they had eight children each per incestuous couple, despite all of the inbreeding over 30 years per generation, so that they would have from, from eight people to 150 years, they would have 30,000 people who by then would be so genetically disadvantaged that they would actually believe the things that Ken Ham says. <laughs> There's another problem with that, of course, is they're taking, there's a lot of other things that they fail to take into account. One of the many mistakes or omissions uh, that they made with their calculation of population was having to do with the exodus, which is another thing we know didn't happen, right? It's a surprising thing. Uh, we, the experts in biblical history can't be sure if there was a David or a Solomon or even if there was a Jesus, right? But we know there was no Adam and Eve. We know there was no Moses either, and that blows the whole out of everything, right? I mean, there was a, the, the, the senior rabbi, David Wolpe, gave in a sermon, or not a sermon, what do they call it, I don't know, uh, in, in the Passover in 2001, he said that with very few exceptions, every archaeologist agrees that the way the Bible describes the Exodus is not the way it happened, if it happened at all, right? Undermines the whole thing. We know that there's no place that Moses fits. And then one of the things that we know that don't fit is the Hebrew slaves. Biggest problem with Hebrew slaves is the numbers. The numbers are always wrong in the Bible. 40 of this, 7 of that. We know that these are contrived. Even if there was a real event, we know that those are not the numbers. Right? So there's a point where there's supposed to be 2 million Hebrew slaves living in one town in Egypt at a point where the entire population of the country was only 3.5 million. That means that these Hebrews outnumbered the entire natural national population, all in one town. How did they not own the place already? How do you discipline two billion people with, what, ten guys? Because <laughs> remember, when these guys cut loose, they cut down everything around. According to the Bible, these desert brigands killed millions of people, hundreds of thousands at a time, right? And more than Answers in Genesis can even were alive at that point, right? And then you got to wonder about the God that's, you know, they're going to their promised land, right? Well, what's the promised land? The promised land was they already had a half a dozen tribes living there. And God says, no, I'm going to promise you this. I know there's already people there, but I'm going to send some angels to kill them all, because that's what kind of a nice guy I am. But it gets worse than that. 
So let's imagine, let's ignore the uh, women and children and the, the elderly and so forth, and just think about the 600,000 Hebrew men on foot that the Bible said lived in Ramsey, or was it Ramsey? Yes, Ramsey. And they're going to run to Canaan, which is their promised land. And if they follow the coastline, the Red Sea up to the Mediterranean Sea, and they walk 20 miles a day, it would take them a fortnight to get there. Now let's say that they walked single file, one man, one meter ahead of the next guy, which is a reasonable distance. The first ones would get there before the last ones left. That's how many Hebrews were supposed to be there. And it's only 450 kilometers or 280 miles. And it's hard to get lost when you're following a coastline. But the Bible says that with God's help, a two-week trek turned into 40 years of wandering lost in the desert, <laughs> eating who knows what that's falling out of the sky. How's that for divine guidance? Right? And then this 40 years of the blind leading the blind came at a time when most people didn't even live that long. So nobody that started the trip finished it. How's that for a promised land? Only the kids that were born along the way had any chance of getting out again. So the creationists know that the numbers don't add up and they don't care because this isn't an attempt to understand anything. This is all about make-believe. They need to make you believe. They'll tell any lie necessary, and I give many examples in this book, where they know that what they're saying is not really true, can't be really true, and they don't care. Deceivers seek believers because they need the patsies to pay their tithe and to reinforce their preferred delusion. <laughs> and as I've already said, it is a preferred delusion. I've actually seen, I'm not even kidding about this, I've seen people when they start hearing the facts, they do, do like that girl did, where they say, you're just hurting people, why can't we believe what we want to believe, even if we already know it's not true? I've seen people plug their ears, and do the closing the eyes, wah, 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 I can't hear, because they don't want to know. It's like what Shelley was saying about the, the guy that doesn't want to have it confirmed. You would continue to believe something that you know is not even probably true. There's a fundamental difference in the way these people believe versus the way I think most of us do. So the creationism, I mean, what I just described is true of any religion, but creationism is more extreme. Yeah. Creationism is more extreme than that. It's a, it's a, a form of religious extremism that is so, they have to deny reality, and they're so willfully obtuse that their faith matches the description that psychiatrists give for psychotic delusion. Matter of fact, if you look up the National Alliance on Mental Illness, you'll see that they give the delusion, or the definition of delusion is a fixed false belief that will not change despite evidence to the contrary. Matches everybody you argued with online, doesn't it? <laughs> and what is psychosis? It is a detachment from reality, which kind of fits too. But then, in both cases, for both definitions, there is a caveat, except when it's a person's religious, cultural belief system, that it's only okay when religion does it. So in my book, I give a lot of the science that's relevant to all of this, and it's hard to find otherwise. I don't think anybody's ever written a book like this that also talks about the dishonesty and the hypocrisy and the absurdities, atrocities, inconsistencies, and contradictions in the Bible, as well as many of the prophecies we so often hear claimed that have actually failed rather spectacularly if you look up what the prophecy actually says and what what history and the Bible say. So the purpose of this is to provide a biological and theological reference to explain how to refute the fundamentalist favorite fallacies in their attack on the sanity of science and secularism. And that's my presentation. The books are available in the lobby. Thank you very much. <laughs> I take it there's no time for questions. <laughs> but they can come and talk to you after the presentation. Yes, well, what's your name? You've got to say it right. <laughs> in the first page in here? Yeah. Yeah, on the first page of my preface, I explain that my name is not Aaron, it's Aaron. Uh, and everybody gets it wrong. And I explain it, it, it's spelt like Aaron, but pronounced like registered nurse. R N. <laughs> for him. Thank you so much. All right. So here is what's going on here. I would like to thank our volunteers who worked so hard to make this entire weekend possible. I would also like to thank our sponsors. Applied Office on-site computer training, Paul Story, The Original Motto Project, Reason Center, Humanist Association of the Greater Sacramento Area, 
No More in God We Trust, Freedom from Religion Foundation Greater Sacramento Chapter, Logical, Amy Pfaff Insurance Services, Central Valley Alliance of Atheists and Skeptics, Healthcare for All Sacramento, Foundation Beyond Belief, <laughs> Center for Inquiry Los Angeles, Black Humanists and Nonbelievers of Sacramento, Sunday Assembly Sacramento. And I would also like to thank these champions for donating to support today's in event. Joseph Morrow, Angela Garvey, Ian Garvey, David Noel, Nancy Sneed, Fran of Evanesco, Kenneth Nahigian, Ruth Rizos, Sarah Tigert, Greg Martin, and anyone else who donated, especially those who supported us today, thank you so much. Thanks to the Secular Coalitions for California and America and everyone attending today's Secular Advocacy Day, which is not today, tomorrow. Thanks to Camp Quest West for providing our child care. I'm now going to do a first position plie. I will now come back up. Thanks to John Lucas and Rick Tracewell for our fantastic sound system. Our photographer, Matt Martin, and our videographer, Roger Zabke. Our local affiliates of the Secular Student Alliance and the organizers of local meetup groups from as far as Reno, San Diego, and the Bay Area, Reason Center for providing a home to many of our local groups, John Vandenberg for, yes, John Vandenberg for helping us attain 501c3 status and making your donations tax deductible. Where is he? He's here. Alan Levin for hosting our website for many, many years. Ray Howard, Elaine Tuskian Care, and Cordy Brothers for donating items to last night's and today's silent auction. Panera Bread, Holiday Inn, Hampton Inn, and Round Table Pizza for discounted food and lodging. And one more round of applause for all our speakers, entertainers, and authors. And thanks to the California Free Thought Day Committee and David Diskin once again. Thank you so much, Marie. How about that MC? How about that? Let's give her a round of applause for doing such a wonderful job. And I'm sorry that you didn't get a chance to see her perform. Well, she did that little ballet thing, but I trust me, if you go to MarieBain.com, much more than just the ballet thing. Amazing music. Her Kickstarter finishes tonight. I want to thank Sperry Commercial, without whom we would be wet and outside in the rain all day long. Let's thank them for doing this, letting us be here at no cost. As you guys make your way out, uh, if you head out towards that direction, back where registration is, you're going to find that we still have a few items that are there. Snacks, books, all kinds of other things, including some discounted items. So please get your credit cards and cash and check ready to check out over there. And again, give us one final support, uh, uh, fi financial support. If you'd like to help, boy, could we use it. If nothing else... Just grab your chair and stack it on other chairs or against other chairs. But if you can give us half an hour, then you can help us clean up a little bit and get things loaded and organized and all of that kind of stuff. And maybe if like two or three of you are free tomorrow morning, come see me because we could use that help as well. Oh, yes. I have not forgotten about that. Um, and don't forget that at 6 o'clock, in fact, probably in just a few minutes, I want you guys to head over to Reason Center, and uh, we're going to get a march of people going that direction at 6 o'clock for their after party. They've got hors d'oeuvres and light snacks because they want to show off what an awesome community they have built for us, for the secular community here in Sacramento. Let's give a round of applause for the Reason Center. And as Randy said, I hope that all of you are able to join us tomorrow morning at the Capitol in room 127 at 8.30 in the morning. And I promise you, although it doesn't sound like a lot of fun to wake up and do that, it actually is kind of fun. And it is so important, I cannot stress enough how much important it is, how important it is to make sure that your elected officials know 
that you are secular and proud, right? Right. right. All right. And finally, I want to see all of you here and so many more next year, October 14th and 15th, 2017, for the 16th annual Free Thought Day. Thank you. Drive home safely and have a wonderful day. And remember, hashtag... One more time, hashtag... Good enough. Have a good night.